Hello, everybody. We're going to uh, reconvene. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Alan Byrne, and I'm the the president of the, of the Newfoundland Historical Society. Uh, the Newfoundland Historical Society is very very happy to be partnered with Memorial University on this event again, and uh, we 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 actually partnered on with, with them on in the fall on another uh, event. It was it was fantastic. So great to, great to be back. If you do. Uh, if you do, I'm, I'm the president of the Newfoundland Historical, Historical Society. If you do happen to be out milling about during one of the break periods, you'll see that we do have a a, a little kiosk set up, which which is, gives a sample of our what what we do. And uh, we have we our, our our mandate, I suppose, is to is to make a be an academic forum for history, but but to provide it in a make it publicly available and accessible. So uh, so events just like this, actually. So if you if you if you do enjoy uh, today, then you might consider becoming a member of the Newfoundland Historical Society. Actually, I believe our two panelists this morning are, because uh, we do hold a lecture series which runs the duration of the academic year, and I do believe our two speakers are lecturer emeritus. Are we? <laughs> Have both spoken, <laughs> I believe, at some time or another. But, I'm still uh, not a member, though, so. Oh, well, that's. No way. That's, that's, that's a shame. Oh, we're. <laughs> That, that'll be it for today, folks. I got my checkbook. I swear to God, don't kick but, me out. <laughs> certainly, from from uh, Mr. Ashworth's uh, opening comments, it's very clear that 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 the war consisted of very many different conflicts over, uh, you know, uh, over a l large tracts of lands and periods of time. So it's often difficult to parse out to different conflicts from, from one another. Uh, so what we're going to do th this morning with this session is is, is analyze is analyze two particular battles. Uh, at, at Jutland and, and Gudicor. Our, our two panelists for the session are, are Dr. Margot Dooley and uh, Dr. Shannon Lewis Simpson. And uh, I believe uh, Shannon, will, Shannon will, uh, will speak first. Dr. Dr. Shannon Lewis Simpson is, is the uh, is the experiential learning coordinator at Memorial University and has been appointed as an adjunct professor in the Department of Archaeology and lectures on Viking Age archaeology. She's a senior officer in the Royal Canadian Naval Reserve and is appointed Canadian Forces Liaison Council Officer for Newfoundland and Labrador. She's also been working to digitize the Royal Naval Reserve Newfoundland Division records at the rooms, and she's lectured on aspects of their service in, 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 in Newfoundland and recently at the National Maritime Museum in, in Greenwich. Dr. Margot Dooley uh, holds degrees from Moore University and Duke University. Uh, she has an MA in history. Um, she's awarded uh, a rather mere fellowship and she subsequently studied at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London where she received a PhD in South Asian and British Imperial History. Her books include uh, The Cross-Cultural Study of Women as well as Where Once Our Mothers Stood We Stand, an analysis of the Newfoundland women's suff suffrage movement her recent publications in Newfoundland history in, in the World War I era include women's patriotic work, uh, a biography of Armand Gosling, secretary of uh, the WPA, and the leader of the surf suffragists, as well as a study of Nurse Mona Loner's, Loder's service on the Western Front. Margot is Professor Emerita of History at East Eastern Michigan University and Dean Emerita of the College of Arts and, Sci and Sciences. Uh, University of Illinois Springfield. Her interest in Royal Newfoundland Regiment stems in part from her from her family history. Her uncle, Second Lieutenant Lionel Dooley, was was killed in World War One at uh, Kyber, Kyber Ridge in Belgium. Her father was Captain Cyril Duty, Dooley, MBE, who was uh, seriously injured but survived. Her grandmother, Trifina, was an enthusiastic publicist for the Women's Patriotic Association, but her aunt, Margaret Dooley, the novelist became one of the few uh, public but very bitter critics of the war. So uh, interested to, 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 uh, to hear those, both, both those sides. And uh, I'm going to call Dr. Margot Dooley to, or sorry, Sh or Shannon, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Shannon Lewis Simpson to start. Thanks. Very good. Now, how's this working? Excellent. Good stuff. Um, yeah, well, we can see who has the imposter syndrome here today, but I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have been asked. 
um, I have a, a love of naval history, as you can imagine, and uh, I have very many good friends and along the way who have helped me uh, learn a little bit more about the Royal Reserve, and I'm certainly happy to um, elucidate a little bit about their service at Jutland, and perhaps um, add a few other names to our roster from the great works that Dr. Mark Hunter, who's in the audience, and uh, Dr. Ian Parsons, and of course his late father, Dr. David Parsons, have written as well. And I'm indebted to their scholarship as well for, uh, for this presentation. So thank you very much. Now, Dr. Ashworth has a certain artifact in his possession. It happens to be my personal copy of Jellicoe's account of the great uh, fleet, 1914-1918. Uh, you cannot keep it, sir. So please pass it round. There are the maps in the back, and I had an occasion to call that out when I was preparing this lecture. And uh, I have a hand up. I'm a, I'm a Jellicoe girl, not a Beatty person, but you know that's it. They both have their. Uh, I'll put that out there right now. He his, actually his picture was hanging in my office when I had command of it, so it's all good. So it's first we should say, I suppose, that the Battle of Jutland was to the Royal Navy and to the, the you know the Marine Deutsch the battle. You know, it was a done deal. Naval strategy up to World War I centered around the battle, der Tag, the day, the one definitive engagement that would settle all naval conduct of the war and for which all ships and equipment were designed. When and where this battle would take place were unknown, but there, that there would be a battle between the fleets and it would be the battle was a given. I'm not going to analyze the battle. That would take far longer than what the, uh, this conference would allow for the entire day. But uh, what I'm going to do is, is argue that it's not really the battle itself which is of interest to me. It was what led to the battle and the technological um, advancements that Jackie Fisher made to the Royal Navy um, in a period of like 100 years of stagnancy, basically. And it's also what happened after the battle and the conduct of maritime war resulting from the sort of impasse that resulted from Jutland and what the role of our naval reservists had within the Battle of Jutland and more importantly what else happened afterwards. Um, so we should really speak about the battle itself before I talk about a little bit more about the social history of the sailors who were involved. Um, there's a really great website um, it's called Jutland1916.com, and in it is a very accessible account of the battle narrated by Nick Jellicoe, which is Jellicoe's grandson. There are also excellent charts and uh, statistics and everything you'd want to know about the battle. But suffice it to say that it was over a 12-hour period, 8,500 men died, um, 249 ships of war were involved, um, 9,600 sailors at sea. And around the uh, Royal Navy at that time, there were about 200,000 sailors in the Royal Navy during World War II, World War I. Um, one in 10 sailors died. So there, this battle, one considers a few actions that happened, a few phases that happened during the conduct of the battle. Um, the first is, the two, you know, the two fleets basically came together and the battle cruisers engaged one another. Um, Indefatigable and Queen Mary were destroyed. Within the space of 20 minutes, 2,000 men were killed. Uh, the main mags blew up, the ships were gone. Beatty then took the British, the, the German fleet, and drew them north to meet Jellicoe, who were coming south. He drew heavy fire during that time, but he was successful in engaging the German fleet and getting them to move where he wanted to. Then Jellicoe had an excellent tactical advantage in the sense that he encircled the German fleet and drew down a ring of fire upon the German warships um, to try to annihilate them, basically. Admiral Scheer um, decided to have a sort of Hail Mary approach to, to warfare and encourage uh, torpedoes towards the British line. Jellicoe, in order to increase the distance between when the torpedoes were fired and when they would you know, engage, he turned away from the German fleet. And some would argue um, that that was a cowardly move. You know, naval officers are not meant to turn away. But he did it purposefully in order to increase the distance of the torpedoes so they wouldn't arm themselves and, and you know, cause damage. Because, of course, when you're winning a battle, the last thing you want to do is try to lose it. So he turned away. This was at dusk. And then when he turned away and came back to re-engage the German line, they'd gone. He couldn't find them any longer. The intelligence was horrible on the day. His commanding officers didn't report their sightings of the various ships. The muddled mess, basically, of the night. 
there were night actions then that followed. And Scheer tried to use his intercepted information and intelligence to find a weak spot in the line to break through and go back to Germany. And that's indeed what he did. So apologies for the synopsis of the, of the battle, but that's in essence what happened. And the, the result, of course, is that um, there were more British ships lost than German. There were more British lives lost than German. The Germans called a victory of the battle. Um, but if you want to take a battle's winning, or who won a battle on the basis of who won their stated objectives, I would argue that, and many others before me have argued that the Royal Navy indeed ran, you know, won the day because they regained or maintained their sea control. The British fleet could not break out, and indeed it never did afterwards. It rusted in harbor and the fleet mutinied in 1918. So it rendered the Grand Fleet useless. Then they moved on to a period of um, unrestricted warfare, uh, submarine warfare. So we can talk a little bit about that. Where did we get to that point, though? Um, one of the places where we got was a reinitialization of the fleet. Before Trafalgar, uh, Trafalgar huh, see, the, the, the notion of Trafalgar room, looms large and had loomed large basically from 1815 to, you know, to up to, to, to Jutland. Um, 1805, yes, sorry. Hand on heart. So 100 years. Um, when the, the main fleet um, was um, before World War I, there was 1,000 ships in the Royal Navy, uh, varying speeds, unable to speak to each other, unable to operate together, an incoherent, splintered fleet of obsolete ships. Then you had someone who should have been obsolete himself at the age of 63 and retired, but he absolutely did not. He came in and he revitalized the Royal Navy. Um, Admiral Jack Fisher, um, a polarizing person. Uh, the officers didn't like him very much because he was very much a lead from the front, get his hands dirty type fellow. He um, espoused the value of working. And sometimes for naval officers at that time, who were members of a certain class, actually getting one's hands dirty and working alongside the men was an anathema. So he had a different view of what the Navy should be and what it could be. But there's no doubt he was a visionary. There's no doubt that his uh, ship um, procurement and building program revitalized the Navy and, of course, leading to the creation of the dreadnoughts before World War I. And, of course, that precipitated um, a naval arms race between uh, Imperial Germany and the Royal Navy. Because before the Imperial German fleet was created from nothing, one could say, the Royal Navy didn't have an adversary. There was no one who could match it. There was no one that even was going to try. But they needed to keep up with the technologically advanced and far more modern German Navy, which again was built from nothing and that was in its favor because it didn't have the weight of tradition hanging over it as well. So on that tag, or the day, 249 British and German warships engaged each other with roughly 100,000 men in the fight. To put this into context, the modern Royal Navy in 2016 has 77 ships. The German Navy has 56 ships. The Royal Canadian Navy has 25 ships, with a total force of less, less than 14,000 sailors and officers. So it just puts it in perspective how many people are actually involved. I should say as well that the Americans have 430 warships, and the Chinese have something like 492, but they're in a class to themselves, so perhaps it's not a fair comparison to make. So how do we bring the sailor into this mass of tonnage and men and battles and all that sort of thing. And that's more my interest, is to unpick the stories that one finds in the service records, in letters, and in the contemporary newspapers of the day. And that's where I'll bring us back today, if, if you don't mind. Please don't ask me about tactics later. I, I, I'm not interested, but it's fine. So I'd like to thank, um, personally thank Larry Doe and his colleagues at the rooms. Um, I very much enjoyed the, my time when I was working there. Had to step away from it now for a bit, but most of the service records have been digitized. It's now a matter now of putting them together with all of the things as well. Um, so 
in a cursory inspection of the service records that we have, because of course some sailors, we don't have their attestation sheets, they don't exist. But there are a few other names that we could perhaps add to the list that Dr. David Parsons and Ian Parsons and Mark Hunter have also noted. One of these is uh, Christopher Prince from um, Charleston. And he served on the King George V. And what's unique about his service, I think, is that he was on King George V for almost the entirety of his service. Which for most Newfoundlanders, if you look at their service records, they jumped around quite a bit. And they were also gone back and forth to the shore establishments and the training uh, throughout their ter terms of service. He was on King George V. Now, which one is a little thingy? Oh, good, right? So you can say there, King George V. And he was on from 25th of March 16 to 20 September 18. So almost the duration of his service. Um, and, you know, King George V, of course, was one of the super dreadnoughts. So he was one of a crew of almost 1,100 men. And you can only imagine, he was a seaman, he would have been on the upper decks, he would have been standing watch, and taking part in the Battle of Jutland very much above decks, if they were on watch. And I would assume that most of them would be at that time when they were engaged. She wasn't engaged too much, though, during the battle. No hits um, to made on her, and no hits that she fired made on anybody else. So, you know, I'm not a fan of the dreadnoughts, I got to say. They were um, useless. And, and, and certainly she was scrapped shortly following the uh, Washington Naval Treaty, which was um, put forward that all the dreadnoughts were to be decommissioned and taken out of service to prevent a sort of another arms race, to be honest, after the World War I. So another would be uh, John McCormick. Um, haven't found out where he's from yet. He served in HMS Malaya at, uh, at Jutland. Her, she did do work at Jutland. She fired 215 15-inch rounds and received seven 12-inch hits, sustained 63 killed and 68 injured on that day. Um, he also was a seaman, as you can see there. And um, he went on then and served in the dams. Um, the uh, defense of our merchant ships and all that sort of stuff, which most of our Newfoundland sailors were on, to be honest, as seamen. They were renowned for their seamanship. They were renowned as well for their seamanship as members and coxswains of boarding parties, naval boarding parties. And that's where Jutland leads us after. Another man is, was Archibald James, not Jeans, but James from Upper Island Cove. Um, he served in the Duke of Edinburgh and uh, for almost a year. Uh, you notice that he signed up for, you know, one year, right? One year, not the duration. But of course, we know he demobbed in 18th October, 1919. So the majority of them, they'd sign up for a year, but they never came back. They stayed and uh, carried on with their service, which was wonderful. And he had a full career, there's no doubt about it. Um, he was a gunner. And it should be said that a lot of the Newfoundlanders who served at Jutland were gunners, which is a good thing because uh, they were needed. Um, she spotted um, the light cruiser Weisbaden at 6.08, and Invincible had already damaged her, and then she basically finished her off with 20 rounds. All but one on that German ship passed, then died. So that's uh, Duke of Edinburgh, the ship in which uh, Jane sailed upon. And of course, supplying the guns was not easy work. You know, you had, uh, and the amount of the rate of fire in the salvos was, was fierce. Um, you had to bring up the rounds or whatnot from down in the depths of the ship um, because of uh, cuts to safety and uh, doors being left open when they perhaps weren't, fuses being left where they weren't supposed to, uh, ships like uh, some of the other ships, main mag was blown up, and then they went. So things, because of the intensity of the fire and the rate of fire that was required, they took shortcuts, and that led to some ca to casualties, there's no doubt about it. So the next fellow was a character, there's no doubt. He was a gunner, Ogos Tro, he was from Bay de St. George, um, or OJ, I'm not sure, Ogo. He served in HMS Revenge, he was 23, he did 10 days in detention on Revenge, but you can also see that he had a fair bit of a detention everywhere else. So, uh, quite an interesting character. And being from uh, the West Coast, you got to wonder, was it a uh, language, a barrier? Was it a cultural barrier that caused him to not perhaps fit in with the Royal Navy and the way of doing things? 
one could argue this might be a case. It, it, I think that this one needs a, a closer investigation as to why he uh, was unhappy with his service in the, in the Royal Navy. And Seaman George Thomas was another gunner, and he served in HMS Marlborough. Uh, Marlborough was not really heavily engaged in any sort of action before uh, Jutland, uh, so it allowed them time to prepare for the battle, also uh, teaching its young sailors and officers how to waltz, which was great. And we're lucky because we have the um, uh, papers and the diaries of uh, able seaman Charles Bertram Jones, and he has some excellent photographs of, of the waltzing club and the bear, which was the mascot and lived on board HMS Marlborough. You can imagine in Jutland there was a bear. There you are, you've learned something today, I did. Um, and so he has a diary, and if you'll allow me, I'll read a little bit to you, because I'm hoping that he wrote that up in good copy after the battle, because that seems to me exceptionally neat for someone who's putting down fire on, uh, on uh, enemy warships. But uh, if you, 612, Red 7, cruiser, four funnels, one mast, disappeared in smoke and mist before fire could be opened. 617, open fire, seven salvos were fired in four minutes. Fifth and seventh were clearly seen to hit. In the fifth salvo, a steep red flame would be seen as salvo struck. In the seventh salvo, a large column of grayish smoke appeared. 621, ceased firing as enemy was hidden by a cruiser on fire, room class. 624, green 93, a cruiser, three funnels, rune, one funnel gone, range by rangefinder, 10,500 yards. 625, Open fire. Hits could not be distinguished for certain as two or three ships were firing at same object and enemy's movements were difficult to follow. <laughs> 654. Marlborough was hit by torpedo in diesel engine room. Shock was sufficient to shake off switches on lower power board. Some fuses in telephone circuits. These were quickly replaced and all control instruments were found to be in step. Two men in diesel engine room were killed. I think that's a nice um, account we hear that one of the reasons why the fire of the British ships wasn't successful at Jutland was the amount of splash over the vessels, the amount of smoke that was in the air, the mist that was rising. But this is an account from the gunners themselves, you know, and how their circumstances changed throughout the course of the battle in order to be successful and get hit, hits downrange, but also when they missed and why. I think that's a, a nice account, so I wanted to share it with you. The torpedo that he spoke about there caused so much damage to Marlborough that she was, um, she was uh, um, uh, sent off. Jellicoe detached her from the fleet. She wasn't making enough knots. She was only making 15 and 3 quarter knots, so she couldn't keep up with the main fleet uh, for the next action. So he detached her for the night actions, and she went back to base to, um, you know, to prepare herself. So it was good. So at five miles, it was still possible to identify enemy targets. And here's another gunner. You know, we were full of them. I don't know what was going on. Calypso must have been very good in its gunnery drills. Um, Headley Wareham joined the reserve earlier than, um, I don't have his uh, record, so I can't tell you when he joined, but I can tell you that in 1913, he attended the coronation of the king, and the king gave him a coronation uh, medal. He represented Newfoundlander in the coronation. Um, he was in Gloucester during uh, Jutland. Um, then he went on then to become a mate in the Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve, and he served on um, HMCS Coastal Drifter 28 out of St. John's. So we'll come back to the Coastal Drifters at the end of this, of this little talk here. He also then went on to pass his chief mate's inspection, had a successful career at sea. So there were a few other Newfoundland sailors who served at Jutland uh, who are mentioned in contemporary newspapers, but who, who are not reservists, or at least if they are, I can't find the reference. So I think they probably joined the RNR in England. This one did. This is Jack Avery. Um, and in September 15, 1916, the Daily Star did an uh, extensive interview with him. And perhaps if we can get that photocopied afterwards, it might be interesting for people to have a look. Or you can look it up on the Digital Archives Initiative, which is part of the uh, Memorial University Libraries, which is fabulous. So if you'll permit me, I'll read you a little bit because it's quite interesting. Um, Avery got to Warrior five days before Jutland. And as he says, it wasn't even enough to learn the name of my commander. Right? I was on the first dog. The dog watches from four to six, he says. I was down in the stokehold, and he was a stoker, I should say. He was half an hour firing up. 
I came on deck for a breath of fresh air. I was on deck a few minutes when I saw a large ship on the horizon. I said half-jokingly to my chum, who was standing by, Look at the Germans! While we were speaking, we saw a flash, and we knew it was no joke. We had sighted the enemy, sure enough. Shortly afterwards, the order, General Quarters, was piped, and all rushed to their stations to get ready for it. How'd you feel? Starr asked him. He tossed the ash from his cigarette, he said. I didn't feel anything unusual. We are used to the order, you know, because we get it every day of our lives. It's part of our regular routine on ship. But did you feel a bit concerned about your fate? Oh no, says he. I had my work to do, you know. But I must say, I did wonder a few times how the boys overhead were getting on, and if they were getting the best of it. We fellows down below hadn't much to worry about. A shell would have to come about ten tons of coal to get through us. He says that the starboard engine of Warrior was put out of business, so he was on Warrior, and Warrior was sinking. So he put on his life belt. They would, the boys overhead weren't doing very well, apparently, because Warrior started to sink. I swam away from the suction of our ship, which by this time settled down rapidly. I was in the water for four hours when rescued by one of our torpedo boats. They took me on board and gave me some hot rum and put me to bed. The next day, I was feeling pretty good, though I had received a bad wound in one of my fingers during the engagement. These are the kinds of stories that the service records can't tell us. And unless we have the letters and the accounts in the paper, we don't know. And this is one of the problems, I suppose, with um, commemorating uh, naval engagements. The stories are always of ships and not people. It's very difficult to parse out the individual stories and what they were actually doing. He wasn't worried about getting hit by a torpedo because he had 100 tons of coal. But we know that ships actually sunk because of that very reason. So whatever his chief engineer or whatnot was telling him down below to stay down below and to motivate him to get the coal in the ship and do the battle, because of course the prelude to action is in the engine room department, as Jellicoe said. Right? So there was another few people who uh, passed um, during the, uh, the vessel, the bet during the, uh, the battle, um, another Newfoundlander who was a chief gunner on uh, HMS Black Prince, George Cuthbert Collingwood, he passed when the ship sank, as did three officers who were on board HMS Defense. And this is one of her pictures underwater now. Uh, it's now a war grave. Lieutenant Commander Hugh Fielding, who is actually a cousin of Lady Davidson, uh, Surgeon Lieutenant George Johnson from Trinity, and Midshipman Trevor George Lawton Hales from St. John's were all three lost in HMS defense. And there was only one Newfoundland reservist that we could ascertain who died at, uh, at Jutland, and that was uh, Seaman John Hiscock, and he was from Hitman's Harbor. The star was interesting, the way that they um, announced his death. And it goes to show the um, attention that was paid to the dreadnoughts, almost at the exclusion of everything else. While the Star regrets to hear of the loss of one of our gallant boys in blue, we are glad to know that a member of our contribution to the Empire's naval forces had a share in that great battle, which has so smashed the German fleet that it's unlikely to venture beyond the protection of its land forts for months to come. He was on uh, HMS Invincible, which of course broke in two, and all hands were lost, except for a few. Um, the, the, the focus was very much on the battle, on the battle, on the day, and on the dreadnoughts who were seen to be the super weapon that would annihilate one or other of the fleets. And when that didn't happen, naval warfare had to change, um, which was hard for the Royal Navy um, to be able to adapt to change, even though as chivied along as it was by the excellent officers who led, who led it. Um, there was a certain truculence to change, there still is for that matter. So based on the number of ships lost and men killed, the Germans, of course, claimed victory. And one could say that they probably were victorious. But as I said, on the basis of stated objectives, you know, the objective of the German fleet was to break out. They didn't. The objective of the, um, the, the British fleet, the, the RN, was to maintain sea control. And they did. So one could argue that Jutland was a success. But one could argue that Jutland never ended on the 1st of June. It just changed into a more uh, interesting and more diverse form of faceted warfare. Um, it moved to um, a warfare of unrestricted submarine warfare on the part of the Germans. 
Um, the Lusitania, of course, the sinking of her, kind of put a stop to um, unrestricted submarine warfare for a time. It was deemed to be ungentlemanly, unsportsmanlike. Um, and it was seen to be uh, something that they didn't want to uh, participate in because it was against them in the press. Um, but after Jutland, they saw the sinking of merchant ships as key to gaining uh, control of Britain, to starving her into submission, just as, of course, um, you know, the Nazi war machine tried to do in World War II. Um, and a part of that, of course, was our own sailors who served on ships, on coastal drifters off the Grand Banks, on um, our merchant cruisers, on dams, um, laying mines, mine sweeping, um, hunting U-boats, uh, dropping uh, depth charges or rudimentary depth charges in World War I. They had a large role to play in the war that followed Jutland. So although you know, the battlefield moved from you know, the, that area, uh, the North Sea, I think it, we were certainly still very much in the thick of it. So, yeah, I, I think that, uh, and of course, they may have not looked like sailors, but they certainly were engaged in, um, in naval warfare at that time. So how do we remember these people? You know, we remember those who have passed. We remember those, their service. As I said, there wasn't one single path of, um, of service for the Royal Naval Reservists in World War I, so it can be difficult to consolidate their stories. The only thing I suppose we can do is try to, you know, share them with audiences such as yourself as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. I'm going to uh, just move things right along now. I'm going to call Margot Dooley to present her work. Well, it's a very dangerous role to be in as a speaker, to stand between an audience and their lunch. <laughs> but I will try to be of interest to you. Uh, the title of my paper is Shelling Cripples and Gumboots, Subaltern's Perspectives on Quiet Days at Guy Decor, 1916. And I'm drawing from, actually, my father's field notebook and that of uh, Captain Robert Tate, I'm actually going to focus on quiet days at Guy de Corps and not the main battle for, for reasons that I think will become obvious. The memory of Beaumont Hamill is engraved so deeply on the collective historical memory of most Newfoundlanders that July 1st has become virtually synonymous with World War I. Yet sadly, the casualties on July 1st were only 20.5% of the total sustained by the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. Ten other major engagements, including the main battle at Guy de Corps, Manchi, and Cambrai, account for a further 60.5% of the total. These battles have been mostly eclipsed in modern memory, um, and it's wonderful to see an even more eclipsed group, the, the casualties in, in the service of uh, the sailors finally being remembered. Um, but if we go back to the regiment, this leaves a further 19%, or 686 casualties, that were incurred not in major battles, but in light engagements. This is usually the term that's used by historians. Or from random shelling, disease, and accidents. And these have receded even further into the background. So I'll talk about uh, the main battle of Guy de Corps as a kind of setup for uh, what I'm about to do. Um, and the reason I'm focusing on the weeks after Guy de Corps, I hope it doesn't seem self-referential because my father was involved, but that is not my main motive. It is to illustrate the grinding attrition uh, that was part of World War I. There is a field message book, and actually let me hand one around to you. 
Um, they're really a missing resource, in my opinion, for the study of World War I and Newfoundland. Some of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with them. Only a handful have found their way into the archives at Memorial or at the rooms. But they help us to understand uh, perspectives of the war further down, just as soldiers' memoirs do. And we have a, only, regrettably, still a handful of these. But the field message books show what it was like from the perspective of usually lieutenants or cap captains, sometimes NCOs, what it was like to manage the war from the ground, and I think they're quite revealing. Um, they contain, as you'll see, things like status reports, orders received, rough hand-drawn drawings of trench maps that are very revealing. Um, they contain memory jogs for officers about their duties, and they also provide information about individual soldiers. For example, my father's field notebook contains the names of all of the bombers in D Company um, at Guy de Corps and then after. And similarly, he, he was in the reserve at Beaumont Hamill. Um, he, there are names and, and duties assigned to, to um, soldiers that appear in his field notebooks that are not in the soldiers' records. Um, so I think they're very valuable um, for both a broader understanding of the war, but also for family historians who are trying to find out something about their soldiers. So let me first, um, let me also say that the period I'm going to cover is actually missing from the regimental diary. And that, I think, is because um, Colonel Haddo had left uh, the, the field exhausted, uh, Forbes Robertson had taken over, and there seems to have been some kind of shifting of duties at battalion headquarters, or perhaps they just forget, forgot to keep the diary. Um, and in addition, um, had a, uh, 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 in addition, uh, Nicholson's wonderful history of the regiment misses most of these days, probably because Sidney Frost, on whom he relied for a great deal of information, had been wounded on October 12th. So let me just go ahead and show you where I'm talking about. Um, you can see actually Beaumont Hamill uh, on the extreme left of your map. And Guy de Corps is uh, almost at the center right here. I'm going to refer to Guy de Corps and Fleurs and Les Boeufs. Essentially, the regiment was operating in this sector throughout October 1916. They're only a couple of miles away from each other. Uh, you can drive them in five minutes these days. Um, the engagement at Guy de Corps was, of course, part of the larger battle of Transloy ridges. And Transloy is up here. And there was a spur uh, tra of Transloy that gives the battle its name. Um, the battle actually begins on October 1st. It's the last, it, Transory is actually the, the last battle of the Somme, the prolonged battle of the Somme, and it lasted until November 18th or 19th. The sources, historians disagree as to when it actually ended. The other point I'd like to make is even though it has formally ended, shelling continues. Uh, it's still a dangerous place in which to be. There's no major forward movement, but there's still extreme danger. Um, British troops uh, in this sector were mired in a muddy lowland that included former German trenches captured mainly in September, whose protective parapets now faced the wrong way. The battle consisted of a series of largely unsuccessful attacks over a heavily shelled landscape denuded of trees and habitation and against a quagmire of mud and cold and wet weather. British forces did manage to take SARS, which is here, uh, in early October, um, partly by the use of tanks. Um, and Haig also, as has been alluded to earlier, uh, at Guy de Corps, uh, attempted another innovation. He, was, he did learn uh, from Beaumont Hamill uh, the creeping barrage aimed at suppressing German fire. However, this was the initial stage of testing out this, this tactic, and there was poor coordination between the artillery and advancing troops, and a very narrow 
no man's land. It was about 300 yards to carry out really with what was pre precision aiming and advancing. And as a result, there were a number of Newfoundland deaths from friendly fire. The regiment went into the firing line just north of Guy de Corps on October 11th, and due to intense German shelling, had 104 casualties before their attack had even begun. The next day, the regiment succeeded in their first objective, which was taking Hilt Trench, which is just north of Guy de Corps, 400 yards away, but were unsuccessful in forcing their way forward another 400 yards to Grease Trench on the Brown Line. As is probably well known to, to uh, this audience, they held Hill T Trench uh, despite the forced retreat of the Essex Regiment that exposed their left flank. The Newfoundland advance marked the farthest forward position of any British troops, and they captured German prisoners and machine guns to boot. Thirteen soldiers were awarded major medals. And Lieutenant General Aylmer Hunter Weston lauded the regiment as, quote, better than the best, a phrase that has survived to this day. Guy de Corps, of course, is the site of one of the memorial caribous. Um, it is also a, a pilgrimage point for the Australians, I might add, uh, who also suffered very badly in this sector. It was, it was lauded in the press, um, especially in Newfoundland, as a great achievement. However, taking the longer view, which historians always do, as there were no further British advances and the regiment suffered 239 casualties, really, ultimately, it achieved little. Extraordinarily, probably in an effort to beef up the recruitment campaign, uh, the Newfoundland Quarterly minimized the casualties at Guy de Corps, saying they were, quote unquote, only from machine guns. Already decimated at Beaumont Hamill, the regiment now had to begin again, or rebuild again. And it was at this point that Captain Tate and 2nd Lieutenant Dewey rejoined the regiment in the field. It was now down to about 460 men. There's actually a discrepancy between the notes and Tate's uh, uh, field message books and the regimental diary as to how many were there. It was down to about 460 men. The casualties included 12 officers, eight of whom were second or full lieutenants, or over one half of the total subalterns serving at that time with the four companies. In addition, one major was injured and two captains were dead. Men were rushed from England to fill in the gaps, including 18 second lieutenants. Many newcomers were as yet untested in the field. Uh, I think about 60% of them were, according to my analysis. But this was not the case with Tate and Dooley. Robert Holland Tate attended Bishop Field College, had been a Rhodes Scholar, and received a BA in law. Part of the first 500, he'd been a lieutenant at Gallipoli and was very seriously injured. He had just been released from the hospital when he was ordered back to Guidecourt. He replaced Captain Augustus O'Brien of A Company, One of the Dead. Two of the four lieutenants in A Company were also casualties. The survivors, both second lieutenants, had been in the 10% reserve. As a result, a second lieutenant, namely A.L. Summers, was adjutant, a position more usually held by a full lieutenant, not always, but more usually. It was a more senior officer. Junior officer staffing in Company D was equally challenging. Captain J.W. Marsh had survived an earned a military cross, but two junior officers had been wounded, and a third was now ill in hospital. One of those wounded in D was, was Sidney Frost. As a result, when 2nd Lieutenant Dooley returned to his old company, he had wide-ranging responsibilities, including at times assisting Marsh, 
supervising the training of mill bombers for all four company platoons, and officer commanding Fleur's Line, which was the general name for this sector, as a need arose. Like Tate, Cyril Dooley had been a veteran of Gallipoli and had been promoted to company quartermaster sergeant while on the peninsula. He attended the Methodist College, followed by an optometry degree in Philadelphia, and then joined the family jewelry business before enlisting. He survived Beaumont Hamill in the 10% reserve, but was involved in bearing uh, friends and comrades. After Beaumont Hamill, he was sent back to Newfoundland on official business, but was ordered back to Guy de Corps, France, in late October. The high casualty rate among seven, second lieutenants led to an order recorded by Tate, but I can't find it in the regimental diary, that only four of the regiment's lieutenants were to be used in future at any one time in the front trenches. The depletion of lieutenants was not unique to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. John Lewis Stemple calculated that the average life expectancy of a lieutenant in the British Army was six weeks when he arrived at the front. The General Staff Statistics Branch of the American Army placed the average lifespan of its lieutenants in World War I when they were in actual combat at two to three hours. In 1917, this appalling attrition led to a change in British orders. Instead of leading their platoons into battle, lieutenants were supposed to advance between the first and second lines, but this rarely corresponded with the reality of rapidly changing circumstances once an advance began. On November 1st, I'll pick up the tale there, uh, both Dooley and Tate did an inventory of their respective companies' supply deficiencies. There were very serious supply deficiencies that are not recorded in the regimental diary. Bear in mind that the regiment had just come out of a mire of mud and cold and wet in the preceding month. And as November advanced, Sleet and westerly gales prevailed. In D Company, roughly one quarter needed jackets, trousers, and boots. Twenty were without ground sheets, and the same number lacked gas helmets. About 38% lacked adequate iron rations. There were shortages of small arms ammunition, and lesser shortages of virtually every piece of equipment and clothing. As you'll see there, four soldiers actually had no rifles. Tate recovers, it records a similar situation in A Company. British failures at the Battle of Transloy Ridges was partly due to logistical breakdowns. At Guidecourt, the nearest railway siding was about five miles away. Roads, are, as is well known in this sector, were impassable. Uh, this is uh, taken mid-October. Uh, but conditions worsened. It continued to rain for six weeks. Uh, animals, carts, artillery, and tanks sank in the quagmire. The supply tracks, one hesitates to call them roads, were subject to constant shelling. The field books depict the results in the microcosm. Tate records the number of troops in these conditions needed to carry food and supplies through the bottomless mud to the front lines from support areas. One NCO and 30 men were needed to carry food containers. One NCO and 40 men were needed to carry barbed wire and posts. Based on an analysis of the trench names, in Dooley's notes, the distance to be traveled was roughly 1,200 yards. It's unclear when supplies arrived. It is clear some shortages continued well into December. An additional challenge in early November, as the regiment is rebuilding, was integrating and further training the newly arrived troops. Uh, the regiment spent roughly two weeks at ville sur ancre about seven kilometers southwest of Albert, doing just this, and duly supervised the D Company bombing squad. 
There were some highly experienced bombers left, including Lance Corporal William Bennett, DCM, whose squad had captured prisoners at Guidecourt. But others still, it is clear, needed basic instruction in the handling and throwing of grenades and the loading, firing, and trajectory angles of the Mills bomb, or Mills Bud, as it was known. The regiment was at least supplied with the Mills 36, the latest improved version of the grenade. Though they were at ville sur ancre nearby there were sobering reminders of what lay ahead. It was a casualty retrieval area for field ambulances, and it had a cemetery. On a happier note, the mud-caked veterans got a welcome cleanup. Tate sent his men 100 at a time to a farm courtyard for a bath. There were concerts featuring nostalgic songs from home and the new ragtime hit Oceana Roll that had reached the top of the hit parade on the new talking machines. But as another action neared, soldiers became restive about the censorship of their letters home. Tate had to lecture his men about forging officers' clearance signatures. Now, these three lines show uh, where this is the July 1st line, the 14th, the 15th of September, and now we're up to uh, mid November. Uh, that whole distance is about eight to nine miles. That's how much the advance had occurred. Haig actually recognized the futility of continuing at Transloy Ridge, but he was persuaded by the French to continue in order to relieve pressure at Verdun. And uh, as was mentioned uh, this morning, the Russians in Romania also needed support and the Italians in Macedonia. And so he reluctantly conceded to continue and so the regiment, far away from these higher strategic decisions, uh, was ordered back to the front. This involved a three-day exhausting march through the mire to reach their destination north of the village of Les Boeufs. On the next three days, November 17th to 19th, the regiment sustained another 20 casualties, five dead and 15 wounded. The heaviest casualties came in the Thistle Reserve Trench, highlighting the danger from heavy shelling, even when not going over the top. Bombers and D Company were also casualties, and as a consequence, a new arrival, Corporal Thomas from Hayward Avenue, was promoted to number 13 bomb squad platoon leader after only three days in action. Corporal Thomas would be killed at Manchi. After these losses at Les Boeufs, the regiment withdrew for a short time, but on November 30th, they were back at Fleur's line, uh, right here. Uh, the, su the support line was just back of Les Boeufs, and then there were some forward trenches here that the Newfoundlanders were involved in. These are not days of major battle, or ones in which major medals were won, but rather ones of ongoing light casualties miserable living conditions and sickness that by now were perceived as fairly normal. Here are selections over a two-day period from the status reports sent by Second Lieutenant Dooley. They include some of the casualties that by war's end contributed to the 19% uh, that did not occur in major action. Fleur's line, cow trench, servicing thistle, windy, dewdrop, and summer trenches. Water, food, and clothing shortages. On the preceding night of November 30th, a sergeant and 18 men had been unable to locate food containers in the dark, featureless surroundings. Later the next day, they were able to get food, but a second squad, dispatched to the intermediate dump for water, found there was none available. A nearby regiment was even shorter, to officer commanding W Company, 2nd Hampshire. Herewith, eight tins of water, which I hope will carry you on until I can find out where I stand for water myself. 
The battalion adjutant subsequently issued a scale of ounces by which tea was to be distributed to the shivering troops. The same day, two men were dispatched to Ginchy Corner to obtain waterproof capes. There were none. The next day, December 1st, 10.30 a.m., reference, man missing from mining party. He turned up here at 8 o'clock. It was easy to get lost in this featureless surrounding. Um, essentially, they were in the captured German trenches, and the British maps were now obsolete. And so what they had to do uh, was draw their own maps. Let me see if I can find that map. That's what they're relying on, hand-draw maps like this. This is not your standard 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 40,000 trench map. <laughs> and Tate has similar, you know, rough sketches in his, his books. Sickness and casualties. 11 a.m., December 1st. Herewith, two men who have been sent out of the line sick from B Company. These were Privates Martin Chafe and Private Herbert Harding. Both were privates from St. John's and both were Teamsters. The nature of Martin Chafe's sickness is not specified, and I'm sorry I couldn't find a picture of him for this presentation. But we do know he carted waste. This was a filthy battlefield that still had decaying corpses half buried in mud, as well draft animals bolted from the noise and confusion. By war's end, Dave Chafe had first damaged his elbow and then broke his leg in several places uh, as a cart rolled over him. He was discharged as a corporal. He complained of continuing pain when he walked, but the pension board was very unsympathetic. Private Harding was a member of the first 500. He served temporarily with the 88th Field Ambulance on the western frontier of Egypt, and then at the Battle of fleur Corselet in September 1916, which actually accounts for most of the British forward advance. Um, Shell-shocked uh, after Flair's Corselet, he was briefly hospitalized. It was only a week. It's amazing to read this man's medical record. And then sent back to the Newfoundland Regiment. At Les Boeuf, the continuing shelling in December 1st had unnerved him again. He was again hospitalized with shell shock. Once more, after about 10 days, he was sent back to the ranks. He died at Manchi on April 23, 1917, leaving a wife and three children, and apparently a lady friend in Scotland. And this all became obvious after his death, uh, to the surprise of all parties, I'm sure. Two hours later, on December 1st, 1345, herewith another cripple. Isn't that an incredible word? It's now become so normal to have casualties. Herewith another cripple. Uh, Private A. Holmes, B. Company. Private Archibald Holmes was a fisherman from seldom come by. This injury does not appear in his official record, though the entry cripple in the field message suggests the injury was not minor. His record does note a subsequent injury, a gunshot wound to his, his leg at Ypres in October 1917. In December uh, 1916, the problem may have been trench feet, for this condition was rampant. This is a fairly typical uh, trench from this sector. Uh, the same afternoon, another field note. Engaged this afternoon in cleaning trench, from which we removed mud and water for about 50 yards for depth of one to two feet. Then Z Company, Hampshire Regiment, turned up unexpectedly. At issue, should the Newfoundland supplies be left for them or not? Given the communication challenges, and I think they were communicating by pigeon, it took over three hours to sort this out. Among the supplies handed over, one jar of whale oil to coat men's feet in a largely unsuccessful attempt to prevent trench foot. 
towards the end of this day, Lieutenant Julie, second Lieutenant Julie, at, had to deal with a questionable order. He had a logistical issue to solve. The disposition of 210 pairs of dirty gumboots unfit for use. A brigade staff captain had refused to accept them for cleaning at a nearby dump and ordered Julie to arrange delivery to Bernafe Woods south of Longval. This was about five miles away, around nearly impassable tracks, still subject to, sh to shelling, and there was a danger of exposing men uh, for the sake of gumboots. Exasperated, the second lieutenant took advantage of an unexpected but fortuitous visit of General Cayley to the Fleur's line to get the order countermanded. A week later, Dooley became yet another subaltern casualty. Just as the regiment was withdrawing, he was seriously injured by shrapnel in his leg and his chest. His life was saved by a packet of letters carried in his breast pocket. According to Nicholson, at Gita Corps, at least in mid-October, it took four bearers traveling in three exhausting stages to reach a tramway two miles away that in turn led to a railway station. At Les Boeufs, this is slightly later, later than Nicholson's notation, um, the, the uh, tramway or the main train station was Grovetown Station, really a platform with dripping tents and a dump for equipment taken from wounded men. From there, the destination was much safer by ambulance train to Rouen. But my family history holds that one of Dooley's stretcher bearers was either killed or wounded in the evacuation. I don't think it was a member of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. I, it was, I, I almost certain, a, a member of a nearby regiment assuming that the family memory is in fact correct. A brief postscript. Um, well, before that, let me, let me just make a, a final point. Um, these are just some of the quiet days at Gita Corps, uh, when there are shortages and which are considered to be uneventful by World War I standards. Both Tate and Julie's notebooks show just how extraordinary ordinary had become for the soldiers in World War I. Um, and if I could say one, one final thing by way of a push, uh, because so few of these field notebooks have survived, uh, at least in archives, I have a feeling they're out there you know, in various houses without people really realizing the significance of them. I hope that uh, Newfoundland archives will make an effort to try to systematically collect them. Um, a brief postscript. Tate went on to earn an MC, a military cross, at Port Capelle, but he was wounded for a second time at Neuve Eglise in 1918. He returned to Newfoundland, and he and uh, Lieutenant and eventually Captain Dooley, MBA, worked together at the depot. Their civilian lives were also intertwined. Julie became director of the Newfoundland Tourist Board, and Tate emigrated to Boston partly for health reasons and headed the Newfoundland Information Bureau in the United States that promoted travel to this island. Thank you. Thanks to you both. I don't know if anybody has any, any questions or comments. Well, the dreadnoughts were meant to put down a lot of firepower over great area, you know. Um, they were expensive. They were resource intensive. They demanded a great big huge crew. Um, they had, you know, th there was no doubt about it. There was awesome guns of, involved. Um, they could 
lay down fire on a land or sea target with impunity. But they could probably also be taken out by a submarine very quickly. You know, and submarine warfare just revolutionized the game. You know, when used, you know, appropriately and in the right context, um, aerial surveillance to find the ships neutralizes advantage of surprise and the submarines can easily be deployed with good intelligence and communications to neutralize a very big ship or any ship at all. So what class of warship other than submarines most effective job? Hmm. I don't know. That's the answer to that question. <laughs> Further questions? <laughs> Thank you very much to both of our speakers. That was very, very engaging. And uh, we have. We have some